dreamed I went to heaven. You were there with me. We walked along the streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing. Then someone called your name. You turned and saw a young man. He was smiling as he came. And he said, friend, you may not know me. Then he said, but wait. You used to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you'd say a prayer before the class would start. One morning when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you and he said, remember the time the missionary came to your church. His pictures made you cry. You didn't have much money, but you gave it anyway. Well, Jesus took the gift you gave. That's why I'm here today. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am alive. That was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. One by one they came for as the eye could see. Each life somehow touched by your generosity. Little things that you had done, those sacrifices made. I noticed here on earth, but in heaven now proclaim. And I know up in heaven that you're not supposed to cry but i am almost sure there were tears in your eyes as jesus took your hand and you stood before the lord he said child look around you great is your reward Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am a life that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so
this morning. The book of Colossians chapter 1. Paul writing to this wonderful, beautiful group of believers, the Colossi believers here in chapter 1, and he begins to deal with some things in chapter 1 and the preeminence of Christ later, but he begins to talk about being grateful and thankful. And we're going to pick it up in verse number 12 here of chapter 1 of the book of Colossians. And I want to talk today a little bit about Thanksgiving. This is Thanksgiving week and, of course, Thursday is Thanksgiving Day. And we turn our thoughts, I hope, and trust towards Thanksgiving. Even though many will be turned towards holidays and shopping, especially Friday on Black Friday. Uh, Thanksgiving Day parades and football games that will be on television and you know, to really to come to think about it and truthfully be known that uh, very little bit of thankfulness will be given on Thursday. Very little thankfulness will be giving at all, but really, when you think about it. Matter of fact, the Bible has very much to say about thanks and thanksgiving and thank you. And matter of fact, there are seven different words in the Scripture that it uses for that. For instance, the word thanks is found 75 times. The word thanksgiving is found 28 times. The word thank is 27. Thankful is three. Thank is three. Thanksgiving is twice. Thankfulness is once. Given a total of 139 times, those words are used in the scripture. So God had a lot to say about being thankful and being grateful. Okay? Matter of fact, when we come to, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, we find that 10 times in the Old Testament alone. Then when we come to give thanks, it's found 28 times in the Old Testament and seven in the New Testament. But several years ago, it's been now, I heard that there was a movement going to be started that uh, going about to change Thanksgiving Day from a day of Thanksgiving to a day of mourning. And that doesn't surprise me because we live today in a generation that's unthankful. We live in a generation today that's ungrateful and unthankful and we hear very little of it anymore. We hear very little of anybody giving thanks or being grateful or thankful for anything. Matter of fact, most people today expect that you owe it to them and that it's owed to them and that they deserve it. And, uh, you know, after all, and, and very little thing. And I'm talking about from families to, to businesses to workers to even to the church. Very little thankfulness is given much anymore. Matter of fact, when's the last time you said thankful and said thanks to someone for doing something for you? When's the last time as a married couple you said thanks to each other for doing something? Getting quiet, isn't it? See, we take all these things for granted daily, and we fail to thank one another and to give thanks. But you know, even the Bible even talks about that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. I believe the more and the less and less that we glorify God in our lives, our home, our families, and we cease to give God the glory and give God the praise, the less we become less thankful. See, if we're not glorifying God in our lives, our families, our homes, our marriages, our church, our businesses, you want to know something? We're ceasing to be thankful and to be grateful. And that's something we ought to truly take into consideration. This morning we wrote down a few things here, what I thought thankfulness requires on behalf of, of this passage of text that we're going to look at. And you'll tell you have them there in your study guide. Uh, and you'll see that as we begin to take a look at it. But I think first of all, one of the first things we need to recognize that what you could not produce for yourself, it was a gift. What you have, you could not produce for yourself. Did you know what you've got today, you couldn't produce it for yourself? That it is a gift from God. The Bible says that every perfect and good gift cometh down from the Father of lights from above. And in the content, in the context of the passage here, I can assure you, 
I can absolutely assure you that you could not have it or produce it yourself. It was a gift. I think secondly, to be thankful and grateful and have a heart of attitude is one of humility, humbleness. So much pride today. Everybody's full of pride. It's all about them. Everything they've done or accomplished and me, 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 and, uh, and oh, aren't I wonderful, and look what I've done, and, and look what I've accomplished, and it's all about themselves, and, and so much pride, and there's, there's very little humility or humbleness anymore. But yet if a person is going to come to Christ and obtain salvation, they're going to have to come in humility, in humbleness. You know, I don't know why, because if you've got it, you couldn't produce it. It was a gift, Amen. And thirdly, I think one ought to acknowledge that gift that they have that they could not produce because of the source from which it comes. That's why it's a gift. That's why you can't produce it. Because it's a gift and we need to be thankful and grateful for it. So we're going to take a look at it here. Let's read the verses and then we're going to pray a little bit. Beginning in verse number 12, we're going to start with, notice the first thing Brother Paul says to us. Giving thanks. Say that with me. Giving thanks thanks. Well, what are we to give thanks for or to who? Unto the Father which has made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Let us pray together. Our Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your love, and we thank you for your word now. We thank you for the word we heard in Sunday school. Father, we heard much about your word today and how important it is and how vital it is in our lives. And we have an opportunity here again this morning to take a look uh, into your word and what it has to say about giving thanks. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us now. We ask for your Holy Spirit now to come and illuminate us, give an illumination, understanding, give us wisdom to apply it. Bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said. And Lord, we certainly depend upon you in this hour for your filling and for your anointing and for your liberty uh, in this place. And Father, if there's one here today that's never met Christ or said yes to, to Jesus, may they come to know him today to whom to know his life everlasting. And those that will listen to this later on during the week and around the, literally around the world, we pray that a multitude will be saved and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, again, thinking about being thankful and grateful and giving thanks. Matter of fact, even today, uh, how much did you thank someone today? Did you thank your husband, your wife? Uh, did you thank the Lord for the car you had today? As you drove here in your car, did you give the Lord thanks? Lord, I thank you for this car. Did you thank the Lord for the home you have to live in today? Did you thank him for the clothes you have to wear? Did you thank him for the meal you had this morning or last night? If there's so many, did you thank him for your wife, for your husband, for your grandchildren? Did you thank the Lord today for your church? Did you thank the Lord today for your church family? You see, we, we go day in and day out without being thankful, without being grateful for what God has given to us. And we live in a world where just people, just I hardly hear it anymore especially uh, in the younger generation, but even in the older generation. I mean, it's just like people just expect that you owe it, everything to them or everything is owed to them or they deserve it or because of this or that. And, and there's no thanksgiving for the people that, that do for you, the people that care for you, the people that wait on you, the people that wash your clothes, the people that cook for you. I mean, we could go on and on this morning and yet there's very little of giving of thanks of, to these folks that, that do that and, and for this church to make it work and, and all what went on this past week. Thank you. Thank you, uh, men and women, uh, that came out here and, and labored hard for three long days. And, and Brother Robert especially, thank you for going on this roof and, uh, and, and the courage to go up there and put some, I counted up the other night, that last night over 10,000 lights are on the roof alone. And, and we thank God for that. 
But today we're going to look at something really super good. And that is the three simple little truths this morning. The who of Thanksgiving, the what of Thanksgiving, and the why of Thanksgiving. Real simple, three truths. The who, the what, the why. Are you ready to go? Here we go. Verse number 12, right off the bat, the very first thing, we look at the who of Thanksgiving. Who is the source of the Thanksgiving? The who of Thanksgiving is the source of Thanksgiving. And who is the source of Thanksgiving? The Father. Look what it says. Jesus said here, giving thanks unto the Father. So the first thing about the who of Thanksgiving is the source of Thanksgiving. And the source of Thanksgiving is the Father. He is the source of thanksgiving. And all of our thanksgiving should be directed towards God himself. All of our thanksgiving should be directed towards God. Even though it's good to tell each other thank you, and we ought to, and give thanks and say thanks, but in in the finality of it all, we give thanks unto God. He is the source. He is the who of thanksgiving. Paul said, give thanks unto God unto the Father. We're to give thanks unto God. Why? He's the who, he's the source, and it is the Father. And we ought to direct it. Psalms 92, one says this, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. Let me say it again. What is it? It is a what? A good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O most Hi. The psalmist tells us it's a good thing for you and I to give thanks unto the Lord. Why? Because he's the who of thanksgiving. He's the source of thanksgiving who is none other than God the Father. And of course, that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of our thanks ought to be directed towards God the Father and give him thanks for everything you got. You are not a self-made man or a self-made woman. I can tell you that right now. And what you got and what you have, you didn't produce it yourself. It was a gift that God gave you. If you have finances, God gave you the power to gain wealth. You understand that? Whatever ability we have, whatever talent we have, whatever gift we have, we owe it all to him. He gave us whatever we had. We couldn't produce nothing because you know why? Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. So we can do nothing without Christ. So we ought to give God all the praise, all the glory for everything that we have because everything that we have has has come from Him. Everything. And we need to give God a little more praise and a little more thank you for what we've got and quit complaining and crying and whining and fussing and start thanking God for it. I heard a man pray this morning in prayer time that it, from his heart that he prayed that, Lord, I have no animosity in my heart uh, to the man that, that took the life of my son. I, I've already forgiven him in my heart. I have already uh, have no animosity. And if I even get a chance to meet him and come into contact with him, I want to let him know that there's no animosity in my heart. And I forgive him uh, for this uh, tragic, uh, uh, terrible deed that he's done. And, and I pray that most of all, he would come to know Christ. You see, and then then he can have the opportunity. He don't have to worry anymore about Tony's forgiveness. Now he needs to worry about God's forgiveness. And when he asks God for forgiveness, then he's going to accept Tony's forgiveness. And then they're going to both end up in glory together. And that's what it's going to be all about. We need to give God thanks. Our thanks should not be directed towards ourselves. (laughs) I see that a lot. Oh, thank you for me. Oh, thank you for what I have. Thank you for what I've done. Thank you for what I've accomplished. I mean, we we thank ourselves more than we thank God. I mean, we really do. Oh, well, some of us are so in love with ourselves, we can't get over it. I mean, (laughs) oh, I just love myself so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Aren't I so wonderful? Our thankfulness should not be directed towards our friends. I'm not saying we don't thank them, but not directed towards them directly, indirectly. Our thanks ought to not be directed to our family. Our thanks ought to not be directed towards the government. 
All of our thanks ought to be directed towards God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, giving, giving, that's ongoing verb, that's an action verb, giving, in other words, continually, constantly, always be giving thanks unto who? Look what he says in the verse there. He says, giving thanks unto the Father, giving thanks unto God. So the first thing, the who of thanksgiving is the source of thanksgiving, and who is the source? God, the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where all of our thanks ought to be directed to. Once we take care of that, then we can go about thanking each other and being grateful and kind to one another and giving thanks for what we do for one another and to help one another. And we thank you for that and so forth. But let's give thanks unto God. Giving thanks. Giving, that's an action verb. We need to be continually giving God Thanks for something that we got that you couldn't produce. Now let me show you what you got. Now we're going to look at the what of Thanksgiving. That was the who of Thanksgiving, so we got through that pretty quickly. Amen? I know you all like that one. Okay, good. But let's look at the second part of the verse there. And we're going to go through verses 12 here now, 12b, or the second half, through verse 14a. And we're going to look at five wonderful what's of Thanksgiving. Five what's of thanksgiving of what Paul says we need to be continually, constantly giving God the Father thanks because you've got something you couldn't produce. It was a gift that he gave to you and I. Are you with me? Here we go. He starts right off the bat. Look at this. Giving thanks unto God, unto the Father, notice, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You know what that's talking about? Salvation. God gave you salvation. God gave you something that you couldn't produce if you wanted to. It was an absolute gift from God the Father who gave you and I salvation. And how did he do it? He made you and I fit. He made us Fit, or there it says, in, for, to, to, to receive the inheritance of the saints in life. God made you and I fit for salvation. God gave you and I salvation. I couldn't produce it. You couldn't produce it. Nobody else can produce it. It is a gift from God. And Paul says, give God to you Colossians believers. You give God the Father continually. You give God who is the source of thanksgiving. You continue to give him thanks for your salvation that you could not produce for yourself. Self, but yet it was a gift from him because he's telling them they have it. How many of you have salvation today? If you have salvation today, it's a gift from God. You couldn't produce it. God gave it to you. He made you fit, you see. That's what it says there. He made you meet or fit is what the verse describes here. For, well, you know, for the inheritance, you know what he did? He made you fit for heaven. God made you and I through salvation fit for heaven. Otherwise, you can't get there. Otherwise, you're not going. Otherwise, you're not going to make the trip because there's nobody on the planet that is fit for heaven until God makes them, makes them fit for heaven. And how he does it is by giving them the gift of salvation, which is something they could not produce on their own. It is a gift from God. And Paul tells the Colossi church, you Colossi believers, God has made you fit for heaven. He's given you salvation, which has made you fit for heaven. You give him thanks for that which you have that you could not produce on your own. How often do you thank God for your salvation? Some of us have been saved for a long time. And perhaps it's been a long time since you thanked the Lord for saving you. We ought not go one day without it. We ought not go a day without God thanking for saving us. Giving us this salvation. We ought not go a day without thanking God for making you and I fit for heaven. You see, because otherwise we aren't going to make the trip. The only way a person gets made fit for heaven is they got to have salvation. And you don't get salvation. You can't produce it. God has to give it to you. And he gives it through a relationship through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when someone comes to Christ in faith and trust and belief in him, then he's made fit for heaven. And again, you see, you can't produce it. Only God can give it to you. It's a gift. Oh, thank God. Salvation. Listen to what the scripture says here. God made you and I fit for heaven. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
we needed in order to get to heaven, we had to be made fit or we had to be made righteous. Are you with me? Matthew 5, 20. For I say unto you, now this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is telling them, unless you can become more righteous than the Pharisees, who are the most righteous people on the planet. I mean, they were, they, were, they, were the, they were the set. They were the group. They were the elite. They were the Pharisees of the Pharisees. And the scribes, they were the writers of the scriptures. And, Paul, and Jesus says, I'm telling you, until you can become more righteous than them, you can't enter into heaven. So imagine the conversation went on in that passage of scripture. It says, well, then how in the world then can we be made righteous over above the righteousness of the Pharisees since they're the most righteous there is? And you're telling us if I can't even meet that righteousness, I'm not going to make it to glory. You see, it's not by our righteousness, you see. Listen to what Jesus said in that in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, that is God, hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In other words, Jesus said, in order to become more righteous than the Pharisees themselves and the scribes, you're going to have to let God make you righteous, and the only way that's going to happen, you've got to come to me in salvation. You've got to let me clothe you in my righteousness, you see. Why? Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous. No, not one. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. We've all gone out of our way and become unprofitable servants, you see. They're all for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <coughs> the scripture says that my righteousness is as filthy rags. So, so, so how in the world, Jesus, can I become more righteous than the Pharisees since you're telling me that's the only way I can get to heaven? you got to come through me because God took and made me who knew no sin. I became sin for you so that God could make you righteous to make you fit for heaven. You see, God clothed us in his righteousness. You and I today, we have no righteousness apart from Christ, you see. But we stand today righteous before God because when we accepted Christ and he gave us that gift of salvation that you and I could not produce, it, we, we couldn't do it if we wanted to. It was a gift when we said yes to Christ and he took Christ as righteousness. You see, who, who became sin, he became my sin. And he died on the cross for my sin so that God could take his righteousness and clothe me in his righteousness, therefore making me fit for heaven. And Paul says, Give God thanks for that. So salvation. Look at the next verse. You ought to shout. You ought to get some Baptists to do some shouting in here. I'm telling you, man. We're to give God thanks. We're to be giving God thanks unto who? Who's the, who's the, who, of, who's the who of thanksgiving? The source, God. We're to give him thanks for the first thing. For what? Salvation. That he made you and I righteous fit for heaven. Otherwise, you're not going. Okay, look at the second thing he did. Oh, this is beautiful. Look at the second thing. Found there in verse uh, 13. Who hath, talk to me, delivered us from the power of darkness. Can somebody say amen? That's why Paul says we need to be giving God, who is the source, who is the who of salvation, because not only did he give you and I salvation, not only did he clothe us in his righteousness and made us fit for heaven. Oh, praise God. You got to understand that I was lost in sin. I was bound for hell. I was in the chains of the power of the darkness and of the dominion of darkness and the devil himself, and yet he delivered me from that. I have complete deliverance in Christ today, and God, Paul says, give God thanks for delivering you from the power of Satan himself. Hallelujah. Boy, he's delivered us from the dark, the pains of darkness. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children in the light. 
First Peter 2 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, the second thing that we want to thank God for this morning and give God thanks for, not only that he made me fit for heaven, not only did he give me his salvation as a gift, not only did he clothe me in his righteousness, but I want to tell you something, man. He delivered me from the chains and the power of hell itself. I'm telling you, the devil has no power or no control or chain over me. I've been delivered from the enemy. Hallelujah. Now that's worth thanking God for. Notice what else Paul tells them. Look at the third one there. Now, next one. You ready for it? Not only to deliver us from the power of darkness. <laughs> Look at this. And by the way, this all's in past tense. This is already all stuff that's already been taking place. God's already given you salvation. He's already clothed you in his righteousness. He's already uh, delivered you from darkness. Now look at this. Oh, this is beautiful. This is past tense, by the way, here. Look at here. Hath what? Translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. In other words, he translated you. He moved you into his kingdom. God translated you and moved you into his kingdom. And that, by the way, close friends, is spiritual. Okay? That spiritual kingdom. You are already, Paul said in Philippians 3.20, we are now citizens of heaven. Present tense, right now. You want to know why I'm to give God thanks this morning? I'm no longer a citizen of this world. I'm no longer a citizen of this earthly kingdom. I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. God has translated me already, spiritually, already from this planet, from this kingdom, into his spiritual kingdom, into glory, into heaven. Why? He made me fit. He gave me salvation, clothed me in righteousness. You see, you got to understand that. That's what he did for me. Amen. Delivered me from the power of the chains in the kingdom of Satan. And he translated me. He moved me from this planet, from this kingdom, into his glorious kingdom in heaven. And that took place spiritually the moment you got saved. Paul told the Philippians in Philippians 3.20, for our conversation, that's our citizenship, he says, is in heaven, present tense, right now. You are a citizen of glory. You are a citizen of heaven. Heaven is your home. You understand that? Man, I want to tell you something. But wait a minute. God not only did that for me spiritually, but one of these days I'm going to experience it physically. Huh? Amen? Hey, one of these days I'm going to experience it physically. You see, I've already, I've already had it done spiritually. I'm already a citizen of heaven. You read Philippians 3.20, Paul says, our citizenship or our conversation, look up the word conversation, it means citizenship, is in heaven, period. Already, right now, present tense. Because why? I've been translated. I've been moved spiritually. But I'm going to get moved physically one of these days. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You remember what Paul said to the Corinthians? Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. I tell you a truth that's been hidden. I'm going to reveal a truth to you now under the Holy Spirit. For we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, I'm telling you, physically one of these days, I will be moved off of this planet. I'm going to be translated from this planet Earth into glory. Oh, hallelujah. When is it going to take place? 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord hallelujah there's coming a day when I'm going to be physically moved from the, off of this planet oh I'm telling you and Paul says Colossi believers you better give God thanks for this because again he reminds them this isn't something you could produce on your own I'd love to see some of you try to produce that today get yourself to glory on your own you couldn't do it. But there's coming a day when it's going to happen. I know another time. The Apostle John's on the Isle of Patmos. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. He's caught up in the glory. He's caught up in the spirit. And the Bible says for John, come up hither. 
Come up hither. That's a perfect picture of the rapture of the church because as soon as John arrives in glory, he, what does he see? He sees the church sitting on thrones around the throne of God with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how did they get there? They got translated. They got moved. Mobilization, if you want to call it, friend. I'm telling you, it's going to happen one of these days. It could happen today, and we would be translated into the presence of God in glory. And Paul says to these believers, listen to me, you've got salvation that God gave you. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You couldn't produce it if you wanted it to. You thank him for it. He's the who of your salvation. He's the source of your salvation. He delivered you from the power and the chains of darkness, from the devil himself. Man, he's clothed in his righteousness. And guess what? He's already translated you to glory. Your home's just waiting for you to get there. Man, glory, hallelujah. That's the third thing we need to thank him for. That's coming, my friend. It's coming. Oh, guess what? I'm going to have a new home. You know what it is? Heaven. I've already got it spiritually, but I'm going to have it one of these days physically. I'm going to have a brand new home. Now, some of you I know, you drive an old beat-up Cadillac, and you live down by the railroad tracks, and you live in a shack by the tracks. But one of these days, you're going to live in a mansion in glory. One of these days, you're going to get translated out of all that stuff. That's why Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, because this is what he has done for you. This is what he's given to you that you couldn't do for yourself if you wanted to. That's why we got to give all of our thanks to him. That's why we have to direct all of our thanksgiving and giving thanks is to God. It all belongs to him. All the glory belongs to him. All the praise belongs to him. All the thankfulness belongs to him, folks. Not us. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. And what he's done. One of these days. Oh I'm going to have a new master. Amen. Matter of fact you ought to have a new one now. If you're saved. See you've been saved today. And clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The devil is no longer your master. You have a new master. And his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we use that phrase, Lord, Lordship of Christ. He's my boss. He's the master. He's Jesus, the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the anointed one of heaven. Hallelujah. You got a new master. You got a new home. And again, you couldn't produce that for yourself if you wanted to. That's why Paul says, give thanks. Give thanks. And I'm going to be a citizen of heaven. I got a new home awaiting me. I got a new master already. And I'm already a citizen of glory, but I'm going to experience it one day. Ah, one day in heaven. Praise God. Well, let's look at the fourth one. So what do we be thankful for? Who's the who of thanksgiving? God the Father is. He's the source, right? Okay? And what are we to be thankful for? What's the first one? Salvation. What's the second one? Deliverance. What's the third one? Translation or moved, being moved. What's the fourth one? Look at it. Are you ready for it? You know, look at this. Oh, you ought to, Baptist, you ought to start jumping on the pews. All right. We've been translated, uh, us, unto the kingdom of his dear son. Notice half. That's past tense. You understand it? You're already there. You're already a citizen of heaven, so start acting like it. We're kingdom kids. Ah. Verse 14. In whom, that is Jesus Christ, we have what? Redemption through his blood. We're going to stop right there because there's a, there's a comma. What's the fourth thing that we're to be thankful for? We've been redeemed. Huh? We've been redeemed. How many of you have been redeemed this morning? Huh? We're redeemed by what? What are we redeemed by? Huh? What are we redeemed by? Good works? Are we redeemed by the church? Are we redeemed by baptism? Are we redeemed by some particular denomination or faith? Are we redeemed by going to some schools or classes, taking them? Come on, talk to me, church. Because there's a lot of people think that's how they're redeemed. They got to join a certain group, go through certain classes, do a certain this, do this to have this, all kinds of stuff. Get sprinkled, get poured on, get dunked in the baptistry. I don't care. Join 10 different churches. I mean, a lot of them do that. I'm going to cover it all. Folks, you can join all the churches you want. You can go to all the denominations you want. You can get in all the baptistries you want. You can get sprinkled on. You can get poured on. You can come here and get dunked on. But that's not going to help you get to glory. That's not going to redeem you because your redemption. You can have all the money in the world. You can be the richest person in all of the 
kingdom on this planet and have literally trillions of dollars, but it will not buy you one ounce of redemption. It will not buy you one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ that died on the cross of Calvary for your sin and for my sin. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Church, say it with me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Why? There's power in the blood. There's cleansing power in the blood. And Paul tells this Colossi church and this little band of believers, you be giving God thanks daily for something you have that you couldn't produce if you wanted to. What was it? Salvation. Hallelujah. What was it? Deliverance. Hallelujah. What was it? Translation. Hallelujah. What was it? Redemption. Somebody praise God in this house. I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. God paid for it for us. The price was his own blood. Look at the verses you have before you. Galatians 3.13. Talk to me. Christ hath what? Redeemed us. Now what did he redeem us from? From the curse of the law. Now remember, redemption here. We're talking about being purchased. Christ purchased you, bought you with his blood from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curses it everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now listen to me, why is that important? Because the law cannot save you. The law cannot redeem you. The law cannot give you salvation. The law cannot give you a home in heaven. The law was a schoolmaster. It was to bring us and appoint us to Christ. Under the penalty of the law, the law demanded the death penalty. And by the way, church, nobody can keep the law. Nobody was able to keep the law because, you see, the law was perfect. So in order to keep the law, somebody had to be perfect. And there's no perfect person on the planet that could keep a perfect law until Jesus appeared on the planet. When he became carnate in flesh, God stepped out of the portals of glory, clothed himself in humanity, walked a sinless, perfect lamb of God, a perfect life, a sinless life. He was the perfect man. He was the perfect God. And he went to the cross and he fulfilled the, de- the, the penalty, the death penalty, the demand of the law because he was the only one that could do it. So I'm redeemed from the law today. We got this group out here today, the law, the law, the law. And these are supposed to be even saved people and Christians. They're pushing this thing on the law, the law, the law. There's that movement going around. I know I talk to them. About every six weeks I talk to them. I won't say any more because then you know who I'm talking to. Replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Hogwash. <laughs> Forget it. I don't want to replace Israel to start with because I'm the bride of Christ. Why would you want to settle for second best when you can have first best? Amen? The bride of Christ. God has a wife. Jehovah God has a wife. That's Israel. Jesus Christ, the Son, has a bride. That's called the church. And that's what I'm a part of. Oh, I, would, I wouldn't trade places with them for nothing. For nothing. But thank God I've been redeemed by the blood. Look at Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but talk to me, church, Hebrews 9, 12, but by his own blood, what did he do? He entered in how many times? Once into where? The holy place. And what did he do? Having obtained eternal redemption for us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says this. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed. See, we weren't redeemed with corruptible things. What's corruptible? Silver and gold. Are you watching? Are you reading it? From your vain conversation. That's your manner of living. Received by the traditions from your fathers. But, here's the conjunction, the contrast. But with the what? Talk to me. The precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, that's how you were redeemed. Revelation 5, 9, and that's you and I in glory now. The church is in glory in Revelation 5, 9. You understand that? Come up hither in 4, 1. We got translated. We got moved up. Oh, praise the Lord. And, and look at here. And they sung a new song. That's you and I. That's the saints in glory. 
it. We sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Why? For thou wast slain. Thou hast redeemed us to God by the blood, by the blood out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, people, and nation. I'm redeemed by the blood. And Paul reminds the church of Colossae, you guys need to be giving thanks continually unto the who of, sal- of, of thanksgiving, who is God, and thanking him for the what of salvation. And what is it? Oh, salvation, the what? What is it? Salvation, deliverance, uh, translation, redemption. Somebody say amen. Look at the next one, number five. Not only did we get redemption through his blood, comma, even, talk to me, the forgiveness of what? Sins. I'm forgiven. Now notice Paul's telling them this, and and, and in the tense that this is in, folks, it's if it has already happened. It's if it's, it's already been done. It's matter of fact, it also means that this word forgiven means as though it had never happened. Woo! Hallelujah. What? I have been forgiven. My sins have been forgiven as if they had never happened. Come on, somebody talk to me from where some of you came. Some of you were a bunch of drunks, derelicts, prostitutes, who named it, drug addicts, no matter, wicked, wild, mean as a snake. I mean, you got to be, and God saved you, gave you his wonderful gift of salvation. Man, he delivered you from the chains and the power of darkness. Oh, praise God. Uh, he, he translated you spiritually. He redeemed you with his blood, and he forgave you of all your sins, past, present, and future, as if they had never happened. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you understand that? Can you, now, can you get a hold of why Paul says give thanks? Huh? Can you see why he says give thanks? Yeah, that's why. Ephesians 1, 7 says what? Look at what Ephesians 1, 7 says. In him we have redemption. How, church? Through his blood. And the results is what? The forgiveness of sins. Watch this. According to the riches of his grace because that's in Ephesians 1 7 and Paul comes over in chapter 2 and verse 8 and says for by grace are you saved through faith it is not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast oh praise the Lord Titus 3 7 says being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life Acts 10 43 all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name Whose name is that Jesus' name? You see? So the apostle says, oh, church of Colossae, you believers, you give God the Father thanks. He's the who of thanksgiving. And you giving thanks for the what of thanksgiving. Give it something that you couldn't produce if you wanted to. Did you know all five of these are a gift from glory? All five of these are a gift from God. You couldn't produce them. You couldn't earn them. You couldn't buy it. You couldn't work for it. You understand that? There's a lot of people out there who think they can work for it. They can buy it. They can earn it. No, you can't. No, you can't. I'll go join this group, that group. Just go right ahead. That's not going to get it. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll walk this class. I'll sign this card. I'll pray. That, no, that's not going to get it. So we looked at the who of salvation. We looked at the what of salvation. Now let's look at the why of salvation and we're done. Look at verse 16. Why the, the why of thanksgiving? Anybody got a, an idea of the why of thanksgiving? For by him were what? All things created. That includes you, friend. Notice all things were created where? In heaven and in earth. Visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. You want to know the why of thanksgiving? Because everything begins with God. Everything begins with God. We start out the Bible, matter of fact. The very first verse in the book of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. What? In the beginning, God. It didn't say that God had a beginning. No, he was already there in the beginning. You see, in the beginning was God. 
And then we come over to the New Testament. And by the way, the, the, the Gospels are not written in chronological order. So John could have very well been the first book of the, well, James is actually the first book of the New Testament. But as far as the Gospels go, John could have been the first book of the four Gospels. Now, I didn't look it up, so don't go out here and say that. I'm just telling they're not in chronological order. All right? And what does John start off with in the very beginning? Right off the very bat, John 1.1. 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word, Logos, was with God. God and the word Logos was God and there was not anything that was made that was not made by him so you see the why of thanksgiving is because God is in the beginning because everything begins with him what begins with him your salvation your wonderful gift that he gave you what begins with him your marvelous deliverance What begins with him? Your marvelous redemption. What begins with him? Your your translation, your moving. What begins with him? Your marvelous redemption. What begins with him? Your wonderful forgiveness of sin as if it never happened. Can you imagine that? Just sit and think about that for a second as we're finished. Think of all the sins you've committed since you've been on this planet. Think of all the sins that you've committed you can't even think about and don't even know about. And sit here and think about all the ones that you're going to. Just think. Give God thanks as if those had never even happened. Oh, praise God. Praise God. So on this Thanksgiving season, this Thanksgiving month coming up, let's be thankful to him for number one, who what? Who saved you. Huh? Amen. Number two, who delivered you. Number three, who translated you. Number four, who did what? Redeemed you. Number five, who forgave you. Now I want to ask you a question, and those of you who are watching, listen. What more do you need? What more do you need? The psalmist David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I like to preach a message on that sometimes. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, what more do I want? What more could I want, you see? So you see, what more do you need, folks, when you've been given salvation? What more do you need when you've been, talk to me, number two, delivered from the power of Satan? Oh, hallelujah. What more do you need when you've been translated into glory? What more do you need when you've been redeemed? What more do you need when you've been forgiven? There isn't any more. You don't need any more. That's why Paul says, there is the who of thanksgiving, God the Father. There's the what of thanksgiving, the five. And then there's the why of thanksgiving, because everything begins with God. May we pray together. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your grace, your marvelous word today that you've given to us. Lord, help us to be grateful and thankful every day for that which you've given to us for these five wonderful, beautiful things that are all wrapped up together. Thank you for making us fit for heaven, making us righteous through Christ. Thank you for your redemption through your blood, the forgiveness of sin as if it's never happened. Thank you that spiritually we're already kingdom kids in glory. Thank you one day we will physically experience heaven itself. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you today we have a new master who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for all your grace and mercy that you've given to us. We ask you to bless this time. Now, Lord, this is Thanksgiving time. Those of you that are watching by television, listening on the radio right now, look at me right here in the camera. Don't, go, don't turn it off. Please, don't turn it off. Stay right here with us. Don't turn the radio off. Don't push the button, the remote control. Stay right with us. Just give me, give me two, two more minutes and we're done. Friend, if you've never made a commitment to Christ, if you've never trusted Him, and you've listened to what's been said today, you can have salvation. You can have redemption. You can have deliverance. You can have translation. You can have forgiveness of sin if you're willing to come to Christ today and put your faith and trust in Him. We're going to say a prayer. It's not the prayer that saves you now. Those are words communicating with God. But it's putting your faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross of Calvary. What He did for you. He paid your sin debt and your sin price. Here's what we pray. We confess with our mouth. 
we believe in our heart. We call and we receive. Not hard, not difficult. That's what God's Word says. So pray with us right now. Some of you may be here in the auditorium. Pray with us as well. Simply pray, dear God, that's right, go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord from heaven. I confess that I'm a sinner and I've sinned against you, God, and I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. And he will, my friend, he will. I do now believe in my heart that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He took my place. He paid my sin debt. I believe he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And right now by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and receive you into my heart and life to be my Lord and my Savior and to take me to heaven someday when I die. I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing. Amen and amen. God bless you for watching and listening. We're going to trust that many of you came to Christ today, this afternoon, this morning, wherever you're going to hear this. Next week, you can watch it on television. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on the Internet. And yes, you can even watch it live stream on, on your iPhones and iPads. And we're going to trust that many of you come to Christ to know the Lord Jesus. And one day in heaven, we'll look around to hear our Lord say, Great is our reward. And we'll be rejoicing, bringing our sheaves with us. God bless you. We love you. Jesus loves you. Till we meet again. May the Lord bless you and keep you.